morning of Friday, the 5th of March, 1945, the American army were preparing to enter the city of Cologne. Before them lay a sea of rubble which had once been Germany's fourth largest city. They were awestruck. This once great thriving industrial city, throbbing with energy and power, was now nothing but a heap of twisted iron and broken bricks. Blown up bridges, wrecked railways and rolling stock, gutted churches, shattered towers and shells of factories now lay where this great city once proudly stood. At precisely 700 hours, the order was given for the Corps to advance and capture the city. Tank engines roared into life, their tracks screeching and squealing over the fallen masonry. Steadily but slowly, the infantry advanced. There appeared to be little resistance. The German troops had withdrawn, leaving behind only a small token force to defend the city. Street by street, the Americans cleared Cologne of snipers. By early afternoon, it was all over, and the first of the fighting patrols were about to share an experience they would never forget. These men had seen war-battered towns before. They had already seen the effects and the devastation that the war had caused to the towns of Cairn, Cleve, and Aachen. But they were not prepared for what they saw in this city, Cologne. The sight they beheld was awesome. The city lay in complete ruins, save only for the spires of the cathedral which still soared miraculously to the sky. One war correspondent on witnessing the ruins firsthand wrote, a city is a plan on a map, only here there is no plan. A city means movement and noise and people, not silence and emptiness and stillness, a kind of cemetery stillness. A city should be full of life and when you find instead the complete negation of life, the effect is shattering. As the first of the GIs crunched their way over the broken glass and concrete, they were increasingly dismayed at what they saw and smelt. From below the rubble came the stench of rotting bodies. Gradually from out of the charred walls, from the cellars and caverns dug out of the rubble, the Cologne citizens came out into the bright March sunshine. Small groups of ashen-faced survivors who had lived in candlelit cellars for weeks Soon, more and more groups of people cautiously emerged from the debris. Behind the leading patrol of GIs came the 104th Division, spreading out across the city, mopping up the remaining snipers. Tanks, wrestled their way around craters and over rubble which once was somebody's home. In some areas, the fallen masonry was so deep that the streets below were hidden. All that remained was a mass of gutted, roofless shelves. <laughs> 
and yet beneath this debris, people were still living. 40,000 of the city's inhabitants had makeshift homes amongst the fallen concrete. Before the war, 800,000 people lived and worked in the city. Now, only a handful remain. In the wrecked square in front of the opera house, there was a sign painted in both English and German. It read, Give me five years and you will not recognize Germany again. Adolf Hitler. How did all this destruction come about? It had all begun one night four years earlier, on the 10th of May, 1941. Arthur Harris, then commanding number five bomber group, stood on the roof of the Air Ministry at King Charles Street in London's Whitehall. He was surveying the success that the Luftwaffe were having, bombing the heart out of London. Harris carefully observed the effects of the blast bombs, heavy fragmentation bombs and incendiaries. He noted meticulously the effects of the mixture of all three, and considered how much more successful the Luftwaffe could have been if they had concentrated more aircraft over the target area and had paid greater attention to the mixture of bombs, thereby creating an even greater conflagration. Little had Goering realized then just how much he was inadvertently guiding the hand of retaliation which was to strike back at Germany so disastrously in the future. It was this attack on London that prompted Harris's famous speech to the British nation. The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else and nobody was going to bomb them. At uh, Rotterdam, in London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put that rather naive theory into operation. They sowed the wind, and now they are going to reap the whirlwind. Cologne, Lubeck, Rostock, those are only just the beginning. We cannot send a thousand bombers a time over Germany every time as yet. But the time will come when we can do so. Let the Nazis take good note of the western horizon. There they will see a cloud as yet no bigger than a man's hand. But behind that cloud lies the whole massive power of the United States of America. When the storm bursts over Germany, they will look back to the days of Lubeck and Rostock and Cologne as a man caught in the blasts of a hurricane will look back to the gentle zephyrs of last summer. It may take a year, it may take two, but for the Nazis, the writing is on the wall. Let them look out for themselves. The cure is in their own hands. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Germany, clinging more and more desperately to her widespread conquests, and even seeking foolishly for more, will make a most interesting initial experiment. What the Americans had seen on the morning of 5th of March 1945 was the final horrifying result of that first experiment and the subsequent results of the whirlwind which Harris had predicted. The catastrophic effect of the area or carpet bombing on German cities which had begun with the first 1,000 bomber raid on Cologne in May 1942. Now almost a lifetime has passed since that first terrifying attack on the city. In the intervening years, the scars in the city have gradually healed and the devastation has disappeared. 
The young of today may ask, what was it like? What was it like to be flying through the sky, avoiding the flak and the fighters to drop those bombs and cause so much carnage? What was it like for a citizen to live crouched in a bomb-shattered building whilst the bombs were exploding around them? How does a city recover from such a catastrophe? Whatever the morality of this and hundreds of other raids on cities throughout the world by both the Allies and Germany, perhaps in the cold reality half a century later, there has been a vital lesson learned. War is much too costly and barbarous a method of settling quarrels amongst the nations of the world. Saturday, May the 30th, 1942. Across 53 airfields of England's eastern counties, a damp May mist drifted across the tarmac. Overhead in the sky, dark thunder clouds were forming. The huge darkened bombers of the Royal Air Force stood silently in their dispersal bays. One thousand of them. In the overcrowded messes, 6,000 air crew waited, the nervous tension mounting. They all had heard the rumors that something big was on for this day, but as the minutes and hours ticked away, nobody knew what. For the Commander-in-Chief, Arthur Harris, a huge decision was to be made. Either the massive air armado which had been assembled would attack or disperse. But to mount the operation in such unfavorable weather conditions could be courting disaster. Harris was about to do something which no other commander in history would have chosen to do. He was about to risk the whole of his front-line strength and the whole of his reserves in one battle. It was a bold venture needing audacity and courage. He had already achieved a remarkable logistic feat in assembling the massive force. Many of his aircraft were equipped with the new and revolutionary navigation and blind bombing devices which would ensure maximum concentration of the force over the target area. Here now was the opportunity, one which might not come again, to deliver a blow to Germany the like of which had never been witnessed before. To destroy completely by fire one of Germany's biggest and most powerful industrial centers. To erase from the map of Europe, in one night, a major German city. The weather, however, was standing in the way. Three times the raid had been postponed. Now, on the fourth day, the conditions looked equally unfavorable. It would not have been so critical if this was a normal raid of 150 or 200 bombers. But to put 1,000 bombers in the air, all heading through thick cloud, could invite a catastrophe on an unprecedented scale. Not only was there a great risk of collision over the target area, but a much higher risk was involved in landing the force after the raid. The Luftwaffe had learned this lesson after raiding London in 1940 when they lost 250 of their returning aircraft in crashes. There had been a forecast that the bad weather was about to clear over the Cologne area, but would the break in the cloud hold long enough for the 1,000 bombers to get in and out within the planned 90 minutes? Harris made the decision take the chance that the weather would hold. It would be 
a thousand bomber plan tonight. Around the operations rooms of the airfields, the benches were packed with their crew awaiting the briefing. Now was the time for all of them to know what was planned. For these men, in fact, most of them were only boys, young boys. They knew what this raid could mean to many of them. Whatever the target, death. The senior officer began the briefing. Gentlemen, the target for tonight is Cologne. There was a moment of relief for the air crew. They had expected much worse and much further into Germany. The officer then went on to tell them, tonight the raid shall be no ordinary one. We shall be bombing with 1,000 aircraft. The officer then explained the importance of the target. In fact, Cologne was a very important target. Being a highly industrial city with light and heavy engineering works, there were many factories producing guns, tanks and vehicles which were being used on the Russian front. The city also had an important railway network and centre, with many junctions being used for the transportation of troops and weapons. There were large marshalling yards and warehousing, In the areas of Ehrenfeld, Kalk, and Mulheim, east of the river, there were large chemical plants. In fact, Cologne was one of the most important German cities, with a population of approximately 800,000 people. It was important not only for its factories and military installations, but also because it was the center of trade and political activity. Cologne was also one of the most heavily defended of all German cities. When the crews in the briefing rooms were given details of the intended target, there was apprehension. The briefing officer's queue rested on a rectangular gap in the city centre, not far from the cross which marks the famous Cologne Cathedral. This was the central aiming point, the crews were told, the Neumarkt. The Neumarkt was right in the middle of the shopping and residential area of the old city. They were not just going to bomb the big Ford motor factory and the chief war factories, but they were also going to attack right in the heart of the city. The few airmen that asked why did not like the answer. The intention was to bomb not just industry, but also civilians. The age of terror bombing was about to begin, and the citizens of Cologne were about to experience a scene from hell. Now, all over Bomber Command, air crews were going through their pre-flight checks. Ordinary young men from ordinary homes. For most of them, the battle had already started. A constant battle with fear. 55,000 of these young air crew were killed during World War II, and their odds of surviving a raid were less than one in four. A 25-year-old man would be an old man in Bomber Command. Despite the odds against them and despite the fear and the horror, they contrived to do what was expected of them. And so the final preparations were complete. Dusk had now turned into night. The crews were mustered and were climbing into their flying clothing. They loaded onto the trucks that took them out to their dispersal points where their aircraft were waiting. At each of the bombers, the truck would stop. Groups of young men got out, their parachutes clutched and flying helmets dangling. They scrambled inside their aircraft. As the clock approached zero hour, the force was ready to take off. Not just 1,000 of them, but 1,048 aircraft were ready. Between them, they were laden with over 3 million kilograms of bombs. The countdown was over. The operation would begin. <laughs> 
bomber took its place at the end of the mile-long flare path. Its engines were run up to full boost. With the signal from the controller's lamp, the pilot rammed the throttles full open and the engines roared to full pitch. The brakes came off and the bomber rolled slowly forward, gathering speed with each second. Then it was airborne, the first of the mighty fleet taking part in this momentous raid. All across the airfields of eastern England, the same scene was repeated one after the other. Engines thundered and roared into life. One by one, the Stirlings, Wellingtons, Hamdens and Whitleys of the fire-raising force raced down the stretches of concrete. The skies were full of aircraft. Fully laden and heavy with bombs, they lumbered to gain height, all assembling for the big assault. As they circled, never before had the Luftwaffe's night fighter force been offered such a golden opportunity for targets. But no fighters came. Hitler, against the advice of his commanders and making yet another of his costly tactical mistakes of the war, had forbidden the fighters to attack the RAF over British soil. Considering that 70% of all RAF bombers shot down by the Luftwaffe had been over their own bases as they took off and landed, this order was an absurdity. Had Hitler not given the order, this raid could have been not only the first 1,000 bomber raid, but also the last and possibly the costliest raid ever for the RAF. As the controllers monitored the force across the channel, one of the biggest attacks ever in aerial warfare was underway. It was a disaster that was going to be experienced either by the citizens of Cologne or by the air crews of the RAF. Ahead on the horizon lay the Dutch coast and with it the ground control interception zones, ready and waiting with fighters and flak. At 23.14 hours, the first contact was made. The first of the bomber stream had been spotted on radar. The night fighters were scrambled. They now knew that the bombers were coming. The question for the night fighter controller was, how many? With Cologne still a long way off, the front of the bomber stream came under attack from flak over the Dutch coast. Searchlights were picking out the bombers in the sky, but there was little resistance from the night fighters, only anti-aircraft shells. In England, the planes were still taking off, but now it was the turn of the heavy bombers, the ones that carried the heavy bomb loads that would spread the fires. By now, the first of the bombers were approaching the target. It was 045 hours as two of the bombers began their run up towards the aiming point right in the center of the ancient city, the Neumarkt. The air raid alarms had already begun to sound throughout the city. In fact, they had started at 23.45, but Cologne's sleepy citizens were slow to stir themselves. There had already been over 100 raids since the beginning of the war, and the people of the city were inclined to wait before rushing to the shelters. On this night, the sky was clear. There was a bright moon, but there was no sound of the approaching bombers. But one hour later, the horror of the night unfurled itself. Below were families asleep in their beds, completely unaware of how dramatically many of their lives would be transformed by the time this night was over. The first button was pressed. Bombs gone. Sticks of incendiaries showered the Neumarkt followed by small 30-pound bombs. This was the start of a funeral pyre that the other bombers would spread throughout the city. Cologne's defenses suddenly sprang into action. 
the bombers came under heavy attack. Shells burst around and below the bombers, but still they came. The bombers converged on the city, one every six seconds. They came in from north to south, south to north, east to west, and from west to east. It was an air traffic nightmare as they crisscrossed each other, paying no attention to the briefing which had called for all the bombers to approach the target from one direction. Every crew member was on the lookout, not so much for enemy fighters, but to warn their pilot when another bomber got too close. Below, the city was badly shaken. Incendiaries crashed downwards, splashing brilliant white as they hit the ground, and then turning red as the timber caught fire. As the citizens rushed to the safety of the shelters, the fire engines could be heard, racing through the streets, their sirens wailing. This particular Sunday, I went to Pernipus. This is a residential area nearby, about half an hour from Cologne. I stayed with my relatives overnight. I remember being awoken during the night. The sirens had started to howl and we could hear the approaching bombers. We all went to the basement and I remember I was very frightened as I was separated from my parents. We stayed there for about three hours, and all we could hear was the terrifying sound of the bombs. They were exploding all around us. As house after house, building after building began to burn and fall, the children began to howl. The air was thick with black smoke and clouds of dust. Cologne's nightmare had begun. One pilot on the raid recalled, I had never been on an easier target. We just floated in, making no attempt at navigation. We picked our target carefully, dropped our bombs, and had time to look down at Bomber Command's handiwork. It was an awesome sight. We could see the river clearly, running through a mass of fires. Every street was etched in fire. It was stretched right across the city. The light from them was so bright, I could see the other bombers coming in to bomb. It was appalling. A really sickening sight which left me stunned. I felt so sorry for all the women and children down there. Whilst some of the bombers flew in and out of the target completely unscathed, others in the same wave were ferociously engaged by flackened fighters. All over the city, thousands of men, women and in some cases children, were rising to the occasion with a steadfastness of nerves. Herr Kasman was 14 at the time of the raid. On the 31st of May 1941, in the Velskerstrasse, a warehouse full of building material was on fire. And we all knew there was also petrol stored in this building. And a of Urlaub befindlicher Sanitätssoldat had we by the hand. I was with a friend who was a soldier on leave. We had been great friends before the war. We both attempted to put the fire out with sandbags and water. But the flames were too great. So we rushed over to the headquarters of the fire brigade and tried to borrow a hose to connect to the hydrant near to the warehouse. Und, aber die hatten nichts, ja, die, das war, die hatten, für, wir sind also einfach in die Straße reingegangen. They didn't have anything, so we just went into the Balthasarstraße and found a cart with wheels, one of those things which used to be on top of the fire engines with a hose. Der Sanitätsmensch und ich, wir haben den... We weren't allowed to just take the hose without a fireman accompanying us. And luckily one day, the three of us rushed back to the warehouse with the hose and connected it to the water supply. And then the three of us dragged the hose up the stairs and tried to extinguish the flames. We didn't put the fire out completely, but we did manage to save the part of the building where the petrol was stored. Uh, dieses, diesen Anbau 
A lot was destroyed, but thankfully the petrol barrels did not explode, which would have been disastrous. Firemen from neighboring towns were now coming into the city to help deal with the spreading fires. Reaching the burning buildings was becoming increasingly difficult. The roads were pitted with craters and strewn with the dead and debris. After the Franz Clout rubber works received a direct hit, and then the railway works at Cologne Neeps, fires sprang up all around the area. Rats in their thousands ran out of the gutted warehouses. It was an unforgettable sight. The glare was like daylight. The water lines were broken, severely hampering the fire services. Special lines were laid from the Rhine, and pumping equipment was brought in. But soon the extra lines were crushed below the falling buildings. Mutilated bodies lay everywhere. In every street, in every shelter, there were horrific scenes alongside heroic efforts of gallantry amongst the people. Everyone in Cologne was finding a new and bitter meaning in the propaganda minister, Dr. Goebbels' words. We're all in the front line now. Das wird der Feind in den nächsten Wochen und Monaten zu verspüren bekommen. Dass es etwas anderes ist, Paris und Bukarest, und dass es etwas anderes ist, Köln und Königsberg zu besetzen. 90 minutes later, it was over. The faint rumble of the bomber stream could still be heard in the distance. The dazed population of Cologne came out from the shelters to gaze with horror on a scene of desolation. Throughout the city, the people picked their way through the debris to find their homes. the heavy bombers were now well on their way home. Behind them, the sky was burning a bright orange. With this massive armada now returning to the airfields of England, the airfield controllers faced a formidable problem. The skies were still clear of cloud, but not all of the aircraft could get back to their own bases. Battle damage? Shortage of fuel and navigational errors caused pilots to seek permission to land at the nearest airfield sighted. The long night at the 53 Bomber Command airfield was coming to an end. The dawn light was coming up. One by one, the bombers returned. As each one landed, the count was taken. Would they all come back? Who's missing? As the crews landed their aircraft, they were a different body of men that had taken off. They were no longer the fresh young men that had set out on the mission earlier that night. These men were now physically tired and mentally exhausted. Their postures slumped as they made their way across the tarmac to the debriefing rooms. One by one, they gave their account of the night's raid to the debriefing officer. Finally, they went to their quarters and beds, some to sleep, and some to the nightmare of what they had just witnessed and had been part of. Operation Millennium was now a one-line entry in their logbooks. Later that day, it would make a two-column entry in the national newspapers. After that, it would be forgotten, buried under the news of the sea battle raging in the Atlantic. But for the citizens of Cologne, 
Well, we had survived the night and, and I went home to my parents the next morning. I was very worried that something might have happened to my mother and father. When I turned the corner of my street, I could see my parents carrying buckets of water. They were trying to keep the roof of our house wet as our neighbor's house was on fire. We then helped the neighbors to put the fire out in their house. The damage was dreadful. I remember this was Trinity Sunday. I just thought to myself that everything was all right, because at least we were alive. We had survived. As the morning light came up and the city smoldered, the damage was surveyed. 13,000 homes had been destroyed. Over 45,000 people were now homeless. 1,500 commercial buildings were obliterated and 630 more badly damaged. There was extensive damage to the water, electricity, gas and telephone systems and 469 people were dead, another 5,027 were injured. Within hours, Himmler had issued a directive that any person leaving the city had to sign a declaration of silence about the raid. Anybody breaking this order would be executed. He was taking no chances on the breakdown of morale throughout the nation. It was the attack which was described as the terror attack in the Wehrmacht report. It was the attack that was described as the 1,000 bomber raid by the British. It was the attack which hit Cologne's soul. I would like to say, very badly. Before the morning was over, the sound was heard yet again of bombers approaching the city. This time, however, it was three lonely mosquitoes, but they didn't drop bombs on the city, only leaflets. The message was, the RAF's offensive in its new form has begun. It was certain that on this morning, the Royal Air Force had left no doubts in the minds of the citizens of Cologne as to the horrors that were still to come. But war has a peculiar effect on people, and just as the Luftwaffe had not broken the spirit of the British when they had bombed London, the morale of the people of Cologne had actually strengthened. One woman recalled, never before that night had I known such terror, but I know one thing now, I shall never be afraid again. The aerial bombing of Cologne continued up until January 1945 when the all clear siren sounded over the city for the last time. Few people realized that the last real air raid was over. There was nothing to mark the end of the terror that had begun with the 1000 bomber raid in 1942. Nothing to celebrate. But as one peaceful night gave way to another, there came a dawning of hope. Hope that at last, those terrifying whistles of bombs dropping and the nerve-shattering thuds as they hit the city were now only memories. Many of Cologne citizens today still have memories of those endless raids which devastated the complete city. Another very bad attack happened during the night before Peter and Paul on the 29th of June, 1943. It was very bad, and again we heard the bombers flying over our heads. I remember listening to the drone and praying that the bombers would spare Cologne. Well, they didn't, and the inner city got badly hit once again. The next morning, the air was full of smoke and dust. It was like a thick fog all around, and I had to go to work. When I went to the town centre, I made a bit of a detour just to see what damage had been done. I wish I hadn't. In Landsbergstrasse, I saw some people putting burnt corpses into a bathtub, which was on the street. It was a horrible sight and one I shall never forget. I could also see horses that had been mutilated by bombs. It really was a dreadful sight. 
After that attack, it, it was our turn. The Agnes Vatil, where we lived, got attacked. This happened during the night before the 10th of July, 1943. We'd already been warned by the previous attack, so we went to a wine cellar in Krefelderstrasse. The wine cellar was below another cellar and it made a safe bunker to stay in. We stayed there overnight and the cellar was so deep that we couldn't hear the attack. When we went out the next morning, we saw that all of the houses in our street were on fire. There were flames everywhere. My mother was always very well organized and I remember how she kept wet cloths in her bag. We used these cloths to cover our mouths to keep out the choking smoke. We were running through the streets like this and there was complete pandemonium everywhere. It was horrible, dreadful, and I don't think that I've ever been so frightened in all my life. Gunter Kassmann remembers rescuing his own mother. At the time, my parents lived in the Rigastrasse at number 69, and it happened that three large bombs hit the Allee, which we used to call it, the Rigastrasse, and the third one hit our block, number 69 to 71. Shortly before it happened, my mother and a few others said, let's go to the hall of the basement. It will be safer there than staying here in the basement which was normally used for filing, as part of the building was used as an office. It was very lucky. This was the attack in which the Allied forces used dynamite bombs for the first time. And these bombs were much stronger. They hit the basement with a direct hit. It was very lucky that my mother and the others had taken the initiative together. The house was hit, and the basement that they had been in just before was completely destroyed. It was virtually just the little space in the hallway, where they were all standing, which remained untouched. They tried to get out, but everything was blocked. They did, however, have air. I was outside with the rescuers, trying to get them out. And they were calling for help. They were calling and calling. And I remember that my mother never screamed or cried. In fact, you could only tell by her eyes that she was ever upset. She told me that she had started to pray. She had done this before when situations got bad. And she started to pray very loudly. Maybe it is hard to imagine this nowadays, but people, no matter what religion they were, people, and if I say people, I also mean the 150% Nazis who had to go to the shelters as well, even they all knew this prayer. And everybody just joined in. We heard the praying and knew they were alive. We managed to get them all out safely. You have just mentioned that the people started to pray even if they had nothing to do with the church. I've seen this as well. When we were in the air raid shelters during the heavy attack on the 20th of April 1944, there was a friend of our family who shouted out, Dear Mother of God, please help us. And my father and mother and myself hugged each other very tightly. And I remember thinking that our, our lives would come to an end this night. But Thankfully, it didn't. And every morning after such an attack, my mother would always comfort us and tell us, it does not matter how much we lose, everything can be replaced again. The most important thing is, we are alive. Another irony of war is that in such adverse conditions, people never lose their sense of humor. During an attack on the 29th of June 1943, when I walked into the town and saw the dead bodies, I went to a friend's house and saw that it was bombed out as well, completely destroyed. I feared for my friends and her family. Then I saw that here was a little note pinned on the front door which read, everything lost apart from the key to the front door. I thought this was quite funny, but I knew by this note that they were alive and I wasn't worried about them anymore. Today, the modern European city of Cologne has recovered. The spires of the cathedral, which miraculously survived the bombardment, tower above the skyline in the heart of the city.
Post-war Cologne underwent a major reconstruction program. Wolfram Hagspiel works as a city planner. He is responsible for the city's 19th and 20th century architecture. Es äh, wird viele verwundern, dass der Wiederaufbau in Köln relativ schnell vonstatten gegangen ist. Das Many people will be surprised that after the war the reconstruction of Cologne was completed relatively quickly. Ja, in den, äh, the reason for that is that before 1945, with the advent of the Hitler era, the town planning had already been very extensive. It had already been planned to knock down a large part of the city, virtually 25% of it. In fact, quite a lot of buildings had already been knocked down in Cologne, and large areas had been cleared, ready for redevelopment. There was a planning team, the so-called Planning Society, and when war broke out, the society continued the redevelopment program, the Gau Forum. When the city was destroyed, it was the planning society that planned the reconstruction of Cologne. Many things you find in the reconstruction plans and in the finally reconstructed Cologne are things which had already been planned in the Third Reich. Sind Dinge, die schon im Dritten Reich vorgedacht waren. Those plans included the massive road system. A new railway station and rail network was also planned during the Hitler period. The Severinsbrücke was built in the 1950s, again from much earlier plans. But a great many of the city's buildings have been restored to their original historic form. One feature which has been retained is that of creating residential areas around the city's many churches. Eine Eigenart des heutigen Kölns sind ja in der Innenstadt diese a peculiarity of today's Cologne are the quarters which have a church in the middle of them. This was developed in the post-war period and it became much more dominant than it had been before the war. These areas are dominated by their individual churches and many of the families which used to live in these areas before the war still live there now. Areale, wo also die Kirche dominiert, aber auch People die from Cologne are especially proud of their dome and of their Roman churches which were rebuilt after the war. These churches are very important for Cologne because people related them, because there were none of the castles or palaces that other German cities have. Die romanischen Kirchen, auf die die Kölner besonders stolz sind, sie wurden ja auch mit großen Anstrengungen in der Nachkriegszeit äh, wieder aufgebaut. Churches have always been the most dominant buildings in Cologne, ever since the Middle Ages. And if you look at the paintings from that time, it appears as though Cologne consisted entirely of churches. Sich besonders identifizierte. Diese Kirche waren immer die dominanten Punkte auf in the Middle Ages, there were as many churches as there are days in the year. And it was therefore important after the war to maintain this picture of the holy Cologne, especially after the Nazi era, when people desperately wanted to forget what had happened. The inner city is no longer a residential area. These have been moved out to the suburbs. The center has now been turned into a shopping area. Dann gibt es eine zweite Aufteilung in der Stadt, die sehr wichtig ist und die man auch in großen Bauten wiedererkennen kann. There is another separation within the town which is very important and which is reflected in the larger municipal buildings. Teilweise auch wieder Wohnbereich, wir haben den Kulturbereich mit dem Dominanten. The city was split up into cultural areas, residential areas and a recreational area with parklands. The cultural area includes the dominant building of the opera, which was built in the inner city and has a large area around it, which was designed by Wilhelm Rippner. The cultural area also includes the Walraff Richards Museum and all other museums. It is surprising that the industrial buildings in Cologne had hardly been damaged. The Ford works, for example, were hardly touched by the bombing, and other buildings of Cologne's industries were left virtually unscathed. On the other hand, the town itself was completely destroyed. 
And at the time, this was mainly the residential areas. The reason for that is that the bombing strategy did not target industrial, only residential areas. It is easy to reconstruct how the bombers flew into Cologne and to see how it was bombed. The Aachener Strasse served as an orientation, a landmark towards the center of the town. And this is what the bombers hit. These quarters were bombed very hard and were almost completely destroyed. The Linden Tower, for example, which used to be a very posh area, was totally demolished by the bombs. Surprisingly again, part of the new area of Cologne was hardly hit. This was the area between the rail tracks and the Rudolfplatz, which has now become the Belgian quarter. On the other hand, so many bombs hit the center of town that a staggering 97% of it was destroyed. There is a Tan and Schal joke. Tan and Schal are the two central figures of Cologne comedy, which I would like to tell. Tan meets Schal a short time after the war and he asks, where do you live? Schal answers, oh, I have a house, just two houses down from the dome. Well, back then, just after the war, two houses down from the dome meant three or four kilometers away, because everything else in between was flattened during the war. Many of Cologne's residents that lived through the horrors brought by war are still tormented by the nightmares. But they are not alone. Even today, a lifetime later, those that suffered or inflicted the carnage, whether on Cologne or London or any other corner of the globe, all share a common bond, living with the ghosts of the past, even today, still wondering what it was all about. One RAF pilot recalled, when I think back to that terrible night we bombed Cologne, it makes me feel sick to think of the destruction and suffering I caused. Another, on visiting Cologne at the end of the war, stated, the devastation, the cold, and the despair on people's faces helped me grasp for the first time what saturation bombing meant for the victims. Piloting a bomber was a cold, impersonal occupation. We were concerned with switches and maps and avoiding flak, not with life and death, but now I understand the other side of the problem. 